we're very fortunate this morning to have um, a returning celebrity, if you will, with us, Patricia Johansson, one of my heroes. Um, Patricia began her career in New York in the 1960s as a young painter with one of the first, if not the first, exhibition of minimalist paintings in the city. Um, extraordinarily talented young artist, painter, it gets carried away and starts doing these in very, very early environmental works in the 60s. Enormous swaths of color laid out in nature. Uh, really wonderful works. And then she disappears for a while. She gets married, has children, moves to upstate New York, and, and she ends up making these wonderful series of sketches uh, in her garden. Um, and the snakes and butterflies and just and plants, things that were around her that were available to her while she was living this other kind of life out of the city. And those, be, have be, those illustrations became a series, uh, the basis for a series of experimental garden designs, uh, which Harvard published in a two-volume set uh, a couple of years ago. They're legendary works. Another gardener amongst us. Um, we first got involved with Patricia when she was working on uh, the Petaluma um, Wetlands Park, which is also known as the Ellis Creek Water Recycling Project. Those two things there tell you a great deal about Patricia's career and her thoughts and her preoccupations. The fact that she's dealing with a tertiary level wastewater treatment plant, and she's also creating a wetlands park. She's also creating a sculpture that reads from the air that you can see. Patricia Johansson now moves around more dirt than Mike Heiser does, because she's worked on these huge public infrastructure projects around the country, which she's going to talk about. So. Um, Patricia, welcome back to Reno and to the Nevada Museum of Art. Let me just, okay. So I'm going to talk about only four projects today. And uh, the first one is in Dallas. Um, in 1981, I was invited to design an environmental sculpture for Fair Park Lagoon in Dallas. And this was uh, strictly a sculpture commission from Harry Parker, who was the director of the Dallas Museum at the time. However, it was apparent that the lagoon was environmentally degraded. The shoreline was eroded and the water was murky. Fertilizer from the lawn washed into the lagoon every time it rained, causing algal bloom. There were few birds, no waterfowl, and hardly any plants, animals, or fish. In fact, the Dallas Museum of Natural History had declared the site biologically dead. <laughs> so I began by developing my own list of concerns, which included creating functioning ecosystems and providing living exhibits for the Dallas Museum of Natural History. Lining the shoreline with cypress knees helped to control bank erosion, and creating paths over water allowed people to become immersed in the life of the lagoon. I also began to research what different animals eat because food plants and nesting materials attract wildlife. Um, this is the model. Eventually, two Texas plants were chosen as models for the sculptures because their forms coincided with the strategy of the design. The delta duck potato, Sagittaria platyphylla, had a mass of twisted roots that I arranged to, pre to prevent water from eroding the shoreline. And this drawing, called Shoreline Stabilization, shows how sculptural elements are used as lines of defense and deployed along the water's edge to prevent waves from reaching the shoreline, which had previously been eroding at the rate of eight inches a year. And if you look at this drawing, <clears throat> basically what I've done is use the purple segments to act as, um, um, as bulwarks um, to keep water from hitting those banks. And then if you would draw all of the red segments up together, a little bit like the rockettes, when you see those chorus lines making patterns and moving back and forth, if you would take all of those different red segments and move them up together, you'd see that it forms a complete line across the lagoon. <clears throat> so this is art being used as um, engineering and deploying the forms to achieve the same goals that a shoreline engineer would use. Whoops, let's see. 
And then spaces between these sculptural elements became microhabitats for plants, fish, turtles, and birds. Um, and I'd like to point out one other thing. Because I was trained as a painter, I used both natural color and the color of the work to enhance each other. So if you look at that purple puddle, that's optical mixing like you would see in a Monet painting. It's actually the blue of the sky mixing with the terracotta of the sculpture. And so throughout the project, there are many references to the other arts, to painting, to sculpture, um, and, and to architecture. And then, and then these paths are now used as an outdoor exhibit and teaching facility by the Dallas Museum of Natural History. <clears throat> the roots of the plant were built as five foot wide paths that people could walk on, while thinner stems rose above the water as perches for birds. Leaves further out in the lagoon became islands for animals, while others along the shore formed step seating and overlooks. And finally, children tend to use both sculptures as a playground that combines running and climbing with exploration and discovery. A second sculpture at the opposite end of the lagoon was based on the Texas fern, Terrace Multifida. <clears throat> the spine and leaflets of the plant were twisted to create bridges, causeways, and islands, while cutout shapes between the walkways became small-scale water landscapes, flower basins, and fish ponds. And of course, that's um, duckweed up front, which is a, a favorite uh, waterfowl food. And now, more than 25 years later, pond cypress trees provide a shady canopy over the entire sculpture. And so these projects are meant to grow and change. They're not set pieces that are maintained in place. They work with the living world. Biological restoration was a key element in the design of Fair Park Lagoon. Snails, clams, freshwater sponges, and shrimp, fish, reptiles, and waterfowl are both decorative and members of the food chain. Landscaping was chosen for food and habitat value. A littoral zone of plants that root in shallow water was created around the edge of the lagoon to stabilize the banks, reduce turbidity, and provide nesting sites. The amount of nutrients available to algae was reduced and water quality improved. Flocks of wild birds began to arrive, and today the lagoon teems with life, including many rare nesting birds that had never been seen in this public park. Few would suspect that this is a functional flood basin with an educational agenda, as sculpture provides human access to a functioning ecosystem that continuously evolves. Fair Park Lagoon was a very conscious effort to recreate a freshwater swamp in the middle of Dallas. Some of the most interesting and poetic aspects of the design are directly due to its function, such as when heavy rains drown segments of the paths, necessitating alternate routes. Water fluctuations, which periodically flood and reveal the sculpture, create a transient world of reflected nature and are due to the fact that the lagoon is a flood basin for the Trinity River. Um, and I'd also like to point out those little bird baths and those drinking places where fresh water gathers. So, I mean, it's using sculpture to actually support nature and, and human beings, as well as the, the functional flood control issue. Plants and animals, insects and amphibians living in ecological communities animate the landscape and provide magical sights and sounds, but are low maintenance due to the fact that they are all part of the food chain. And again, when I design, I, I am very involved in sound, in what you hear, in how you move through the space. So I try to use all the senses, think about all the senses when I'm designing something. And because the structures are based on actual plants, people who walk the paths follow the varying curves and rhythms of the biological forms, repeating the patterns of the living plant. So actually translating the patterns of nature into your own body as you move through the work. 
Fair Park Lagoon provides a powerful connection to the living world while fulfilling all the functional requirements of an engineered municipal flood basin. Um, now I'll go on to the second project, um, which is a sewer, basically your municipal sewer. As a designer, I've always been interested in combining large-scale infrastructure with community use, wildlife sustenance, art, and economic development. Ellis Creek Water Recycling Facility in Petaluma, California, combines oxidation ponds, those are the, the 10 ponds, treatment wetlands, and polishing ponds with a 272-acre tidal marsh and mudflat, and is known as Petaluma Wetlands Park. I worked on this project with Corolo engineers, initially as a member of the value engineering team. And this is a classic example. Uh, Corolo engineers had only designed mechanical facilities up to this point. So the important thing, I think, for environmentalists is to be able to somehow engage in the dialogue with the people who are in power and then, and then try at least to turn the ship. And we, we know about these wetland systems. Uh, it's not a matter of lack of knowledge. It's not a matter of lack of science. Um, it's a matter of our becoming more relevant as environmentalists in the world. Um, and so basically, there were two people on this value engineering team. There was me, the artist, and there was a man named uh, Bob Gearhart from Humboldt State University who was a wetlands biologist. And we produced seven alternatives for this sewage treatment plant. And this was the one that the public selected. It was not necessarily the one the, the engineers wanted to build, but my version of events was the one that was built. Okay. In Petaluma, art and infrastructure, ecological nature, and the public landscape are unified within the image of one of the area's smallest inhabitants, the salt marsh harvest mouse, with its tail linked to recycled water reservoirs, which are at the top, a butterfly pond within the mouse's body, which you can see on the right, and a morning glory flower that processes stormwater before it enters the Petaluma marsh. At the, uh, and these are all construction shots. At the heart of the wetlands park, four elevated bermed ponds totaling 45 acres form the mouse's image. 12-foot wide truck access routes along the top of these earthen berms simultaneously contain the pond water and provide more than three miles of public trails. And these trails frame the processing of human sewage, the tidal cycle with its ever-changing patterns of land and water, and the complex relationships between creek, marsh, tidal sloughs, and stormwater runoff. Habitat islands in each sewage treatment cell offer protected nesting and refuge for birds, and vegetation and substrate varies in each of the ponds in order to attract a wide range of species. However, these wildlife islands are also a vital engineering component since they are deployed to direct the flow of water in the basins. Uh, that's another thing about this facility, which is it's very energy efficient. It, uh, it costed out as the lowest in terms of construction and in terms of ongoing maintenance costs. So being environmentally correct in processing the sewage also resulted in, um, in cost savings which was another benefit. Within each pond, zones of dense filtering vegetation, aided by microbial decomposers that live on the plant's roots and stems, filter, break down, and consume suspended solids and heavy metals. These green zones alternate with blue zones of deeper open water. And in these open water zones, sunlight encourages the growth of algae that produce oxygen Wave action further aerates the water, and mosquito-eating fish are in turn preyed upon by fish-eating waterfowl. So again, trying to design the whole system, trying to engineer the whole system so that it incorporates the entire living world uh, and also performs the functions. A grape arbor and pavilion in the mouse's right ear will, uh, will provide shady seating and concealed bird blinds 
while the left ear forms amphitheater seating for tour groups and classes from the Petaluma Public Schools, which use the facility as part of their environmental and science curriculums. And, and this facility is now part of the science program for grades K through 12 for the public schools. Another component of this project that transforms with the seasons is morning glory pools. And you can see the edge of the business park there, which will give you a sense of the scale. Set between a business park, the polishing wetlands, and the Petaluma Marsh, the flower processes stormwater from Lake, Lakeville Highway and business parking lots through a series of bioswales, sediment ponds, and shallow vegetated pools. The petals are compartmentalized to create varying colors, textures, and habitats with plantings targeted to the removal of specific pollutants. And again, I think it's import important to kind of um, think of landscaping in, in terms of very functional, uh, very functional framework. So basically what we're doing is we are selecting the plants to remove all of the or you do your water quality testing and then you select your plants to remove those specific things. The Morning Glory was planted with 16,000 wetlands plants and the patterns can be seen from the elevated polishing pond berms. And again, in the, in, in the, in the spring, it fills with water. The scalloped edge of the butterfly pond forms beaches and roosts for wildlife and a small shelter, the head of the butterfly, provides a gathering place for community groups. Two-point access paths connect the polishing pond berm with Ellis Creek. Um, and you can see the creek, that line on the side of the screen, where the acorn leaching, fish trap, seed gathering, and marsh hunting of the original Miwok residents are interpreted. And again, this was a Native American site initially. Um, Actually, the same people that greeted uh, Sir Francis Drake when he arrived in Point Reyes. This was the same group of people. And of course, at that time, uh, the, the water of the bay went right up to the coast range. It's, there's, much of it's been filled in now. A great effort has been made to attract wildlife um, wildlife to this facility by providing a wide range of food and habitat, foraging and nesting sites, and the wildlife has arrived, including eight threatened and endangered species that have chosen to make this their home. This family of river otters that moved into one of the polishing ponds continues to attract human visitors, while the red-tailed hawk who hunts from the tops of trees along Ellis Creek has discovered a bountiful feast including this endangered mouse. We, well, but we also put in, um, I'm trying to remember how many acres of habitat for this endangered mouse, which basically lives in pickleweed and is very dependent on tidal elevations and refugia so that it can, when there's a particularly high tide, it can climb up on these little mountains, uh, little, little islands, and, and not drown, because it will drown in a very high tide. So, so trying to deal with the whole system at once is what you have to try to do. And then Bota's pocket gopher is also seen burrowing along the trails. Now, I didn't, I, I don't think I have here the snake that eats um, this little animal. Um, but basically, you, you want both sides of the system. While birds are so diverse and numerous, including many rare and endangered species, that several local groups, as well as the Audubon Society, can now conduct tours of the site. By designing the landscape as life-supporting ecological communities, the project has already stimulated measurable economic development. Tourists, as well as locals, walk the trails regularly. A new Sheridan Hotel has been built overlooking the sewage treatment facility. <laughs> famous Point Reyes Bird Observatory has relocated its headquarters to Petaluma. And so they are now right on the shores as well because of the birds. 
The project has also been designed to showcase California agriculture because, again, this land, this land was farmland, and so it had to be mitigated for. But we wanted to um, preserve as much of it as we could, and so the same farmer who was farming the land continues to do so. And, and this, um, this is the Mouse Tail Trail, and this is some of the agricultural fields. And this provides human visitors with an intimate experience of local animals, migrating birds, and cultivated crops. And surprisingly, the facility has attracted a wide range of unexpected users, including recreational boaters and artists. And one of the really interesting things to me was I, I I visited at one point, and there were probably about 25 artists throughout the facility making paintings. They had set up easels. They were making sketches of the wildlife and so on. Um, many people assume that my images are added at the end after all the basic engineering and environmental design has been completed, whereas actually they grow organically as solutions to design problems. In this case, the circulation of water which primarily flows by gravity, and the sewage treatment train. What's really happening here are those ponds are all flowing, the, the water comes into the plant at the top at, uh, on Lakeville Highway, and then it's flowing by gravity all the way down. And so the only time you're pumping the water is when it's pumped back up from the nose of the mouse, and you can see that little water transfer uh, down right in the nose, uh, and then it's pumped back up to UV disinfection and then it goes into recycled water. I try to make all my designs simultaneously aesthetic, ecological, and functional, giving equal weight to engineering efficiency, community use, sculptural form, and sustaining the living world, which are all on the same footprint. I think it is important to remember that within the context of art, public park and wildlife sanctuary, we are processing 8 million gallons of sewage a day, which is going to expand to 16 million gallons a day. We are also producing pristine recycled water, which you can see in the deep reservoir at the end of the mouse's tail. That water that looks like swimming pool water, that was sewage water. Okay. Biosolids generated from the process are used to enrich the land, and our recycled water irrigates local agricultural crops, including some famous Sonoma vineyards seen across the highway. <laughs> and, and by the way, the city is actually making money selling this water, and they can't produce enough, which is why they're expanding the plant, is there, there's a huge demand for this recycled water. And so I think this gives new meaning to the idea of designing for the living world. Okay, and the next, the next project um, is one that's in construction now. Um, it's called the Draw Sugar House in Salt Lake City. And this is a Utah Department of Transportation project, UDOT, funded by improvements to I-80. And it's first perceived as two enormous images, a flower and a snake. The sago lily is sacred to the Mormons because its bulbous, bulbous root prevented starvation during their earliest winters. And Snow Snake is based on a story told by Erastus Snow, one of the first pioneers to enter the valley. He describes crawling on his hands and knees through dense thickets and hearing the rattle of a snake coiled up under his nose. But, says Snow in his journal, as he gave me the friendly warning, I thanked him and retreated. And I think, um, I think it's extraordinary that he didn't kill the snake. And one of the very interesting things to me about studying uh, the Mormon journals was how very environmentally conscious they were. Because they were pioneers and not exploiters, they were not coming to extract wealth. They were coming uh, to, to live here, and they knew that other people would be following them along the trail. So they were very careful not to destroy any resources, any water that might be needed for the horses, the oxen. Uh, it, it's just amazing to me what great environmentalists they were. The initial impetus for this project was a dangerous highway crossing that separates three residential neighborhoods, 
uh, a popular public park and a commercial strip with fast food and big box developments. Surrounded by parking lots lies a shady, sunken repari riparian corridor, a remnant of the original ravines that carried water off the Wasatch Mountains. And um, that's the, the portion that says CSHBD1. Okay, and basically what, ha what has happened is most of these original ravines uh, which carried the water have been filled in. And here is, here is one of the last remaining ones, and hidden, it's called Hidden Hollow, with Parley's Creek framed by willows and cottonwoods, is owned by Utah Open Lands, a conservation group. While two blocks south of Sugar House Park, I-80 entrance and exit ramps ensure a steady stream of high-speed traffic. Thus, a local trails group, the Pratt Coalition, has been working for many years to provide safe passage across the highway barrier between Sugar House Park and Hidden Hollow. And so the original design was simply a pedestrian tunnel under the seven lane highway linking the park and nature corridor with an easement between high office buildings. Now with all of my projects, I'm usually given one thing to do. And in this case, it was, just a, it was really just a tunnel under the highway so that pedestrians wouldn't get hit by cars because several of them had been. But I think one of the important things about getting into this infrastructure dialogue is that you, if you come in with your own agenda, you can offer, often layer many other things onto a project that nobody was thinking of when they first hired you. Okay, so a high berm would have been required to keep rainwater out of the tunnel, this pedestrian tunnel. But it's, and you can see that berm, uh, you can see those topo lines going all around the, uh, the flower. But it soon became apparent that instead of blocking the flow of water, the art project could provide a controlled path for severe floods. This, this became a particularly attractive option to the city after a rain on snow event overtopped the Sugar House Park detention basin and spilled out onto the highway which carried the flood water down to Temple Square. And here you, here you can see the detention basin, you can see the weir, they, they have reconfigured Parley's Creek. It's no longer on the path that it would like to be on. Um, and so what happens is when you get a severe flood, it just comes up right onto the ro roadway. And, uh, and so when I, when I first began talking about this project could become a dam, uh, nobody really was very interested in that. But after this flood, the project was re-engineered. Okay. Thus, the Sago Lily was re-engineered to become a dam with 39-foot-high walls that is now listed on the Utah Registry of Dams. The North Petal um, tips over to become an overlook. The South Petal forms a bus shelter, that's the one along the roadway, and a parapet along the highway offers a view of the plaza below and the entrance to the pedestrian crossing. Flood water breaches the dam near the confluence of stem and leaf paths, flows down a scour-resistant trail through a sunken plaza, then under the highway and down an armored canyon, the flood walls and spillway of the dam, rejoining Parley's Creek in Hidden Hollow. Now, interestingly enough, when I, did, when I started researching this project, this was the original path of Parley's Creek before it was, uh, before it was diverted when they built I-80. The model for both flood walls and spillway is Echo Canyon, one of the most famous landscapes in American history, traversed by Mormon pioneers, the Union Pacific Railroad, the Lincoln Highway, and now I-80. In addition to carrying the trail and floodway, our narrow sunken passageway has been designed to support wildlife and clean runoff from surrounding parking lots and our contractor Boulderscape is experienced in building naturalistic infrastructure. Um, and this is water coming off elevated park, uh, parking terraces from a typical development project. Snow Snake, with its tail wedged between rocky strata near the top of the canyon wall, oxygenates runoff from elevated parking terraces, which cascades in thread waterfalls from the snake's rattles into a pool below. 
As the water overflows into a wide channel, and you can see uh, the, the previous shot was up at the top of the screen. That's the water coming off the parking terraces. And then as the water overflows into a wide channel, limestone terraces configured as snake patterns purify the water and transform into an iris-filled rock reed filter and dense wetlands vegetation that doubles as wildlife habitat and stormwater treatment. The head of snow snake, which is in the middle of that blue circle, appears as an island in a pond and an outfall uh, channels channel stormwater back into Parley's Creek after it's been cleaned. What is discovered, as, and of course there's a, narr there's a strong narrative uh, along with this project. What is discovered as one moves through this interior street is a series of sculptural landmarks that guided travelers along the Mormon Trail. And um, this, this is one of the real sites. And then they are mimicked in miniature in the project. Um, of course, as uh, water cleansing and wildlife habitat. So this is Oil Spring, and then there are other famous springs, Copper Spring and Willow Springs, and they're all real places recreated in miniature as habitat, art, and infrastructure. And of course, this is the oil shale. This is the oil coming up out of the ground um, between the layers, uh, between the strata, and coming up to the surface, and the Mormons would stop here and grease their uh, their gun stocks and uh, wagon axles. Like Echo Creek, our retaining wall is filled with ecological niches, perches, ledges, and nesting crevices, interwoven with planting pockets and small trees. Within the canyon, Cache Cave, a wall perforated with holes and filled with birds, whose chirping was recorded by countless Mormon journalists, and the witches, a group of erosional monuments unfold along the journey. Placed along the busy highway, the 40-foot high witches mark the entrance to the underground crossing and serve as a landmark that announces the location of Hidden Hollow. Um, and this is, these are uh, historical views of the witches by uh, Frederick Piercy and Thomas Moran. They also provide housing and night roosts for colonies of bats, as seen in this cutaway sketch of a capstone. As the trail moves under the highway, uh, so now this is the tunnel, other local features, coal seams, tree roots, fossil imprints, and dinosaur tracks are revealed by this cut through the earth, and the roadbed is replaced by twin slab bridges, opening up the tunnel to light and air. The highway overlook at the left focuses on a, a lily petal planted with Mormon crops, and the veins of the flower can be seen as both irrigation channels and the seven rivers flowing into the valley. Viewed from the north petal's overlook, which is at the top, um, the earthen walls of the dam stretch off into the distance like miniature mountain ranges. They frame the bowl of the lily, forming a microcosm of both the Salt Lake Valley and the Great Basin. This is the same view seen by the first settlers, seeking a wagon route into the valley in 1847. They describe the Wasatch and Ochre Mountains running southward in abrupt parallel walls and meeting visually, like our spillway, at a low notch on the horizon. And the bulbous root of the lily overlooks Parley's Creek as it snakes its way back to its source in the mountains, replicating the sinuous path of Snow's snake. So these, these patterns all, are all there to be discovered, and they are all played off the landforms that are in the land, landscape that you, can, um, that you can see from the different overlooks. Uh, if this seems like a bit too much art in history for a municipal project, uh, consider the fact that a local developer ha has already demolished a small office building that adjoins the draw and is replacing it with a nine-story mixed-use development that will house Westminster College students and contain offices and ground floor retail. And a second developer has acquired a long vacant site along Hidden Hollow with plans for residential and commercial project. And that's, um, that's just, below, just below Hidden Hollow. 
uh, that's CSHBD1, the site below that. And this is land that we couldn't possibly acquire because it's redevelopment land. So its only fate was to be developed, unfortunately. Um, community groups have worked tirelessly on behalf of this project, including these high school students, many environmental, public safety, and trail groups, and these young children who have trucked their model of the lily and the snake to countless meetings at the library and city hall. And in the end, it's always the tenacity of the community over many, many years and many pitfalls that ensure that projects get built. And that's really important. If you want to get anything done, in the real world, you have to capture the heart of the people who are actually the taxpayers and the voters because they are the people that politicians will listen to. Okay. Um, the fourth project is Mary's Garden and basically that entire devastated site on both sides of, of the highway uh, is the coal mining site. So um, Mary's Garden occupies a site that was conti continuously mined by the Delaware and Hudson Coal Company for almost 90 years. The Marvin Colliery occupying hundreds of acres on both sides of northeastern Pennsylvania's Lackawanna River was a huge operation incorporating both the mining and processing of anthracite coal. And you can see the river over there, that riparian corridor, tree line corridor. And you can see the river in the background there. The ecological devastation wrought during these long years of production included toxic ponds filled with black water from the Marvin's two coal breakers and brackish strip mines gouged out by surface mining. The Lackawanna River, which can be seen in the background, contained no sign of life for many decades and eventually caught fire, as did the comb dumps, mountains of waste rock and coal that burned continuously for seven years. So this was a deeply devastated site. Below grade, vertical shafts, ramps, and gangways connect seven levels of underground chambers, including a well-known cave in site that suffocated eight miners and still contains their unrecovered bodies. In 1969, a small portion of this mine-scarred land, 40 acres, was purchased by an order of Catholic nuns, the sisters servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and the land became part of Marywood University. And because this was a reclamation project, I initially chose to focus on the sisters and their message of redemption. Thus, Mary's garden consists of sculptural configurations that form images of flowers associated with the Blessed Virgin, the Madonna Lily, and the Rose. And the project is loosely structured around the joys and sorrows within, within the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which is venerated by this order, and then extrapolated to the sufferings and steadfastness of the miners and their families. And so I was trying to deal with, um, with with their message, but, as, but then to make it into a universal message that any mother could understand. Um, so by dealing with the joys and sorrows, you kind of sp spread it out because we all have those. Um, and and that, that was the basis of the research for this project, in addition, of course, to the coal mining issues. One of the key issues for me in this project was how exactly should damaged land be restored? The Madonna Lily occurs at the edge of a site that has recently been restored by the Pennsylvania Bureau of Abandoned Mine Reclamation. And you can see that here. Volunteer trees and vegetation have been removed. The land has been compacted and terraced into platforms for athletic fields, and huge oversized riprap channels conduct water off the land. And all traces of mining history have been erased. So, is this the way we should restore land? Or are we simply ruining the land twice? And that was the question that I asked myself. Um, are the typical methods of, of reclaiming uh, deeply damaged land correct? I don't believe they are. OK. Now, this is my site, unlike the five-acre wooded ravine that can be seen in the background. 
And so I think we have to be honest about our history, and I think we have to be honest about our future. And I think what we basically want to see each site in terms of it is the bottom line for me is that it's a life-supporting, life-giving site. Not how it looks, but how well it functions in terms of supporting the living world. Lying beneath these massive man-made terraces, the Madonna Lily will capture and store stormwater from the upper campus, and as in Dallas, will provide access to a constructed wetland filled with plants that purify stormwater. The five-foot-wide paths over water will create microhabitats for wildlife and offer students op opportunities for field study in phytoremediation, bioremediation, ecology, and aquaculture. The image of the lily is created from a composite of elements related to the formation of coal, acid mine drainage, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and the history of the sisters who founded Mary Wood University. We know that coal originated in ancient swamps and that contemporary swamp plants and limestone purify water. A filter feeder found in ancient swamps, a crinoid, serves as the center of the Madonna lily with its long waving arms providing paths through the wetland. And then the crinoid star-shaped columnal, this is the kind of stalk where it rooted itself in the bottom and then grew up with the waving arms. The crinoid star-shaped columnal can be interpreted as the star of Bethlehem, one of the joys within the Immaculate Heart of Mary, while from a water quality perspective, the gold can be seen as pyrite, iron disulfide, one of the causes of acid mine drainage. The white color of the lily is both a symbol of purity as well as the actuality since calcium carbonate and limestone neutralize acid and purify water. As it proceeds toward the forest, the green stem of the lily becomes black and shiny, simulating the anthracite coal outcroppings found throughout the site. And so what I'm trying to do is constantly reference the mining history at the site. And this is the mining history. Um, the Marywood Ravine offers an alternate vision of land reclamation, one that preserves the mining history and hardware and the landforms that structure the site while honoring the resilience of nature. And now I'll show you the original form. Historic photographs reveal the enormity of comb piles where 10 million tons of waste rock were dumped from each breaker per year. Women scavenged the piles for bits of usable, usable coal at their own peril, since many were swallowed up in these unstable piles. Today, within the larger ravine landform, tall trees grow out of the tops of smaller dump piles, and the landscape is dotted with rusted pipes that served as ventilation for the seven levels of subterranean coal mines. Surface water does not flow on this site. Uh, and this gives you an idea. This is one of seven levels of what's underground. These are, th these are the mining maps. And this is, the, I'm sorry, that, that is our site. Instead, this, this surface water, whenever it rains, drops down through caverns and voids into the mine pool, a huge underground lake that underlies the city of Scranton and much of northeastern Pennsylvania. So one of the goals of this project is to use this underground water, which remains at a constant 55 degrees year round, as a geothermal resource to help meet the energy needs of Marywood University. Another goal is to restore surface water within the ravine as a life-giving source for plants, wildlife, and the Lackawanna River. Mary's Rose unfurls as a series of concentric circles following the natural topography of the tree-sheltered ravine down to its bottom. Formerly, a small creek flowed here, a tributary to the Lackawanna River, prior to the disruption of the watershed by intensive mining activity. Today, the path of the creek can still be seen, and the creek bed is often damp following rainstorms as water disapp disappears into the mine pool below. At the center of the rose, a lined heart-shaped pool evokes both strip mining pits, which filled with water and where generations of children skated and swam, 
as well as the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The pond offers life-giving water to wildlife as well as reflections of the surrounding forest. A small spillway oxygenates the water as it enters the pool, which is connected on either side to the restored creek. The inner circle of rose petals serves as sculptural seating for students and visitors within this meditative and deeply historical place. Moving up the slope, the middle circle of rose petals reveals the coal mining geology of the Lackawanna Valley's Llewellyn Formation, with its layers of red shale, sandstone, conglomerate limestone, and anthracite coal. Typical, typical synclinal formations, recumbent folds, and overturned strata are both decorative and instructive, revealing the geological history of this place, while landscaping consists of plant pockets that nest within the fissures of the rock. The outermost circle of rose petals, the crown of thorns, is planted with brambles, roses, and blackberries, and other local plants that were significant to mining families. They also provide food and thickets for wildlife and help buffer the sound of traffic along Oliphant Avenue. And hematite nodules, iron concretions that are found throughout the geological formation as well as throughout the ravine, rust and drip like blood, recalling sorrows within the immaculate heart of Mary. And these are, they're almost like cannonballs, and this is iron that's precipitated out. And the topography of the ravine itself creates the sense of looking down into the center of the rose. Mary's garden reveals a landscape where the healing power of nature stands beside the monolithic goals of typical land reclamation. During the mining era, Mary's woods were devastated and relocated as mine props in the caverns below. Today, the forest is slowly regenerating, and there is little hint of the wasteland of cone bank slag heaps, poisonous waste ponds, or the many fires and deaths that occurred on this site. Paths through the ravine curl around and draw attention to remnants of the mining era while honoring the work of nature that is reclaiming its own territory. By evoking the mining history at this site, the joys and sorrows of intertwined lives and overlapping patterns from Carboniferous Swamp to the present day, Mary's Garden underscores the fact that within an ecological community, every element is essential to functional well-being and redemption is always at hand. Okay.